Hello everyone, welcome to this edition of West Island News. My name is Hannah Johnston and today I am joined by the MA of the Jacques Cartier writing, Gregory Kelly. Now, Gregory is the official opposition group critic for cybersecurity and digital technology. He is the official opposition critic for Indigenous Affairs and a member of the Committee on Agriculture, Fisheries, Energy and Natural Resources. Thank you so much for taking the time and your busy schedule to uh, answer some of my questions today. I really appreciate the invitation to come talk to, uh, you know, the West Island viewers. And uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. Now, you were elected as MNA into office on October 1st, 2018. Mm -hmm. What have been some of the triumphs of your term in office? Uh, what are you most proud of having accomplished? Um, you know, in a way, I'm going to say it's, um, I'm proud of the community for how it came together during the pandemic to take care of one another. So that's not really an accomplishment that I had, but I would say that it's something that was extremely difficult throughout the entire mandate to deal with. And just to see how so many West Islanders took care of their neighbors, took care of one another, um, and did their best to get through an extremely trying period in our history. Um, there's a little bit of just saying, I, I, I'm just, you know, the West Island is just known for that sense of community and that sense of belonging. On a little bit more of a personal front, um, you know, as an MA, I guess I can say things that I am proud about is that, you know, in my roles as Indigenous Affairs critic, I, I've gotten up there, I've tried to in speak on behalf of Indigenous people when there has been injustices that they have faced. Uh, for example, you know, the death of Joyce Estraquan and people asking for justice for Joyce. Um, I got up in the National Assembly, I've been asking questions on how we can eliminate systemic racism in our society, how we can make sure that Indigenous people face no discrimination before the healthcare system. Um, so in a sense, that's something that, you know, I've taken my duty extremely seriously to do that and, and to take on my role as an opposition critic uh, very seriously. I mean, in here in the writing, um, you know, a few things that I I'm happy that it did get accomplished. Uh, there's been some investments in our local schools, so Joseph and Rico, there's been an expansion uh, project that's going to take place there. Um, you know, one thing that did happen at the Lake Shores, they added on some temporary rooms, which have been very helpful to increase the capacity uh, at the hospital. Um, and again, two things that I've done as an MA that I've really appreciated. Um, you know, I launched a seniors uh, council and a youth council to try to make sure through my entire mandate, I was speaking with constituents um, that I was hearing their concerns from those two groups and during the pandemic that was vital because seniors are talking about the isolation they were facing, uh, the fear that they had and also too how is the government managing the pandemic and the same thing with my youth council that became really passionate about advocating for better mental health services in the West Island. Uh, so those are some things that I'm, I'm proud about as a, you know, M&A. Um, but of course, there's a lot of work that's still left to be done in the riding. Um, and there's a lot of things that definitely have divided Quebecers in the last couple of months, certain bills that have been tabled by the current government. So the work is not yet done, um, but I really just tried to be a humble, you know, grassroots uh, M&A who is close to his constituents and close to the people that I represent and always pass that message along that uh, not everybody in my riding voted for me, but I've done my best to represent everybody's interest, uh, irregardless of their political party. Right. And as you had mentioned, you've really been advocating for um, Indigenous rights. And as the um, official opposition of Indigenous Affairs, you mentioned in a, an ad address to the um, Parliament that our education system is in many ways failing Indigenous youth. Mm -hmm. um, in your speech, you mentioned that specifically for the Inuit community, 54% of the population does not have a university diploma, and only 2% are currently enrolled in educational institutions. Um, specifically at John Abbott College, you'd also mentioned that there are around 100 Inuit students present there. And you expressed your concern for how Bill 96 might continue to worsen access to education for these communities. What is your plan to improve education for Indigenous youths and how would Bill 96 sort of impact those plans? Yeah, uh, so on Bill 96, you know, I, I voted against it. Um, over a year ago, I spoke about how I was deeply troubled by the fact the notwithstanding clause was put in for the entirety of the bill. So it suspends the rights of all Quebecers, uh, rights that are in the Quebec and Canadian uh, charters of rights and freedoms. Um, so. It's frustrating that we've had to go through that as a community, but yes, Bill 96 
Uh, yes, it impacts a lot of people in the West Island, but there are a lot of problems with the Bill 96 uh, for Indigenous people. And one is the fact is that they have to access services in the English language. For them, it's their second language, but they need to go get healthcare services. Uh, they need to get social services. They need you know access to mental health. You go down the list, youth protection services. They're not historic Anglophone, so that definition that's kind of there is definitely problematic for them. Where do they fit into being able to access services? And they spoke up about how concerned they are. Coming back to education, um, I think that you know Indigenous people should have been excluded from Bill 96 altogether. If I was the government, that's what I would have done. But they didn't hear the calls from Indigenous leadership to do that. So now we have a reality that we have to kind of go forward. Um, again, if I were in power, I would remove them completely from that so they wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, it's a complicated issue, the education part, because if you are on a reserve, the education system is often managed by the federal government. But a lot of the time, Indigenous students end up in our school boards uh, or into our centre de service in French and go to school with, you know, people in the local neighbourhood and in, in, in the community. Um, so one thing that the Indigenous people asked for is that recently in Quebec they created a new ombudsman for, you know, kind of uh, to protect students. Uh, and Indigenous groups said, well, we would like to have our own person named to the council that will, you know, represent student interest. Um, to really be a voice for Indigenous educators um, and students across the province. The government rejected that, but I think that those small things to have more Indigenous people within the system saying, how can we attack and address the low graduation rates in our communities would be extremely important. And working with Indigenous leadership on the best methods possible to have the tools in place to make sure each student can succeed and that they value education. Um, that includes maybe having more Indigenous CGEPs that exist. Um, there is one presently um, in the centre of Quebec towards Three uh, Trois Rivières. Uh, they have uh, CUNA. It's, their, it's, it's a CGEP for Indigenous students, and they're able to train uh, in all different spheres of professional, you know, uh, trades like uh, you know forest industry, um, becoming a plumber, electrician. You go down the list. They have a lot of programs for that, but also just to get your your deck from CGEP. So that's kind of like one example and is having a lot of success that maybe we can look to model something that would be similar in English. But again, it is so important when it comes to Indigenous education that we listen to Indigenous leadership about what are the best methods to put into place. And sometimes maybe it is taking a little bit more time to make sure they have the proper, you know, um, if it is tutors, if it is access to additional training in, you know, English language, French language, whatever it may be. But I know Indigenous students would also like to see a little bit more of their own history and culture reflected in our educational system across the board. Uh, so that's um, a few suggestions I think that I would put into place if I was, if I was in the governing um, party at, at the moment or if we were in power. Right. And um, referring back to Bill 96, I know it's a very contentious issue for West mm -hmm. Islanders, especially at the moment. Um, what have you been hearing from the community? What has their feedback been to the Liberal plan to add three additional French language CGEP courses? What have you been hearing from West Islanders? Um, definitely some frustration and concern. Um, a lot of parents, and I have spoken to some John Abbott students and other students who said, not against more French in CGEP, but it feels like nobody came to speak to us about how it could be done properly. So I think definitely, you know, we need to put this on pause. It's a really big reform that's going to take place because it's not just for English students. It will also be for any French students or allophone students who studied in the French system. This was a CAC proposal. They're going to have to take French courses, core courses, and all that. Um, so there's a big change coming to the CGEPs, and I don't think the timeline that was put into place is is you know fair. It, it's too short. It's putting a lot of pressure on the system. So I think taking a pause would be extremely important. Um, go and speak to students and ask what do they need. Do they need more French language courses, or would it be cultural exchanges? Um, and the same thing too. If we have to improve the French in high schools, that could take a little bit of time. We'd have to find more teachers. Um, so that was kind of that's what I've heard from people sort of saying, you know, they noticed that the three core courses that you would have to do in math, science and all that was taken away from the English speaking community. Now it's just adding additional classes for traditional French language training, you know, your verbs and your, your, your grammar and your speak, spoken French. Um, so they definitely, you know, I, I've heard loud and clear from people on this issue. People reached out to us. And again, I think the biggest thing going forward um, is that there has to be a real proper consultation with the community, um, with teachers, with students, 
with the CGEPs themselves to make sure that if there is going to be more French language training or cultural exchanges added to the CGEP level, uh, that it's done to reflect their wishes and it's also done properly because right now there's been articles in the Montreal Gazette of, you know, hearing from CGEP directors saying one way or another the changes that are to this bill as uh, adding more courses for French and allophone students is a huge challenge. So we might just need to take a little bit more time to make sure this is all done properly. Right, and especially after such a difficult year of online yeah. school, uh, being a student through the pandemic, I can definitely relate to the struggles that we faced uh, recently. Absolutely, and I just want to add something for everyone listening, is that there was a study done by a group uh, that was working on employment of the English-speaking community in Quebec, and one of the things that they highlighted in this study is that uh, French language skills are a barrier for some English speakers um, for accessing gainful employment in the province. So we are bilingual and we've made huge strides as a community. We can be very proud about that, but we have to continue to find ways to make sure that when our young people enter the job market, there is not that fear that they're not able to work in French because we right. are strong, but maybe we do need a little bit more improvement. So if it is when you're a student, you're doing a bit more French, or even when you're entering into the job market, there is stages being offered, proper coaching and training in the job place, um, access to free French language training as long as you need it. Mm -hmm. I think those are all things that are helpful to the community to strengthen uh, the French language and to strengthen their language skills. But again, a top-down approach uh, is not great and we need to just, you know, again, sit down, take the time to discuss how it can properly be done. I think that's definitely something to consider and discussions that families should have uh, mm -hmm. prior to the elections. And you had mentioned how difficult COVID-19 was for yeah. West Islanders, for the whole community. Thankfully, I think we can say we're slowly putting the pandemic behind us, but there are still lingering effects, especially for the loved ones and family members of um, someone who is in a CHSLD who passed away or for anyone whose lives were, were lost due to the pandemic. Um, there was also a very big crisis within the CHSLDs, specifically the Heron residents in Dorval, where 47 residents passed away during the first wave of the pandemic. And recently on May 16th, uh, Coroner Gihan Kamel had released a report sort of looking over what had happened within these residences. And she suggested that the health board's management team was uh, disorganized, that uh, the execution of responsibilities and crisis management within these health boards warrant an audit. And also she suggested that private CHSLDs should receive government subsidies. Um, in what ways do you feel that the health system failed these CHSLDs during the pandemic? And how have you worked to improve the condition of these residences? Yeah, um, you know, the report was, was pretty clear cut on uh, the Heron and, um, and what took place there. Um, there was definitely some decisions, obviously, that uh, at the get-go, Quebec was still allowing, you know, patients to be transferred from hospitals to CHSLDs. There were some measures that, you know, British Columbia put into place to make sure that if you worked in a CHSLD, you only worked there, you weren't going from one place to another, that maybe could have slowed the spread of the virus in our CHSLDs in the first wave. That's all a bit revisionist history. We didn't have enough PPE. Um, there were some real challenges at the get-go. Um, and in this case, you know, I think one thing we saw is, of course, we need to continue to try to attract and retain workers in the CHSL days. Uh, prior to the pandemic, there, yes, there was a bit of a shortage, but it only got exacerbated during the pandemic because people got burnt out, uh, headed towards retirement, felt like they didn't want to work there. But um, I think that at least one thing that should be done after all this is a real, true, proper review to make sure if there ever is another, you know, pandemic, um, we're really prepared and we know exactly what to do the second that something, you know, instead of just saying it's in a faraway problem in China and it's never going to come here, that once the global alarm bells are sounded, we act much more quickly um, and review to make sure we have all the stockpiles of equipment we need um, and that we have the proper measures in place to try to keep our, our seniors safe in CSSL days and in hospitals in, in general. Um, so those are some things that I think are extremely important and again, the Island of Montreal needs to continue to grow its capacity in its hospital system. We need to add about 850 beds, roughly, um, that could be done today to help answer the demand. So we saw a lot of pressure on our hospital system, and we have to keep in mind that a CHSLD is a long-term hospital institution, so continuing to add capacity is extremely important. 
but we also need to make sure that we have workers who are readily available to work in our, our, our healthcare institutions. Um, and right now there's a huge labor shortage, 240,000 open jobs in Quebec. So we need to have, yes, train people to become nurses, orderlies, doctors, uh, but at the same time too, we have to make sure we continue to accept immigrants. Um, we allow them to come here, um, try to go find immigrants, yes, who are trained in the healthcare system. It's not the exclusive the answer, but we can't have an immigration policy that is close-minded either. Right, and I think those are, as the population of the West Island ages, though it's a rapidly aging senior population, I think it's another very important conversation to have. Are there any other conversations that you hope that West Islanders can have? Are there any issues or topics on the West Island that you'd like to address that you feel don't have as much visibility yeah. as you would like? Yeah, I mean, well, I'll just come back to the point about, you know, we talk a lot about CHSL days, but we also know that seniors want to stay at home. So we have to make sure that senior care at home uh, and continues to improve. Um, the Liberal Party is proposing to offer tax credits of $2,000 for senior 70 and over to help them pay for some of the costs of remaining at home. Um, I think that's extremely important and it's what I hear from a lot of seniors too. Um, there is a certain point where you may end up in a CHSL day, but they want to stay at home or in a home, if it's a condo or an apartment, as long as possible in their communities. So that's something important to make sure that they have the means to do so. Um, I think some other things in the West Island, I mean, uh, things continue to pop up, but one thing that is definitely you know, maybe not, it's definitely not being talked not enough, enough about, but since 2018 to 2022, um, I think people have faced a lot of divisive politics here in Quebec. And, you know, I'm somebody who always tries to build bridges between all communities. I think that building bridges is based on making sure everybody has, you know, equal rights before, before the law. And um, also just, you know, in our communities, everybody works so well. Anglophones, Francophones, Allophones, Indigenous people across Quebec, they live in peace and harmony. And sometimes I feel our politics don't really reflect the truth on the ground. So I'll go out there and continue to advocate for West Islanders and for anyone in Quebec who just believes that we all, you know, pretty much get along well and live well together. Um, and in respect of one another, and it's not just a question of tolerance, but it's acceptance that we we, are, we have differences, but diversity is a strength that we have, um, and it helps build a you know a more fruitful society. So that's one thing that I think is on front, front and center. A lot of people ask me like, Greg, it feels like we're back in the 1990s, and politics is so divisive, and uh, I just don't get it. So I'll I'll try to do my best, of course, always stand up for the community. Um, you know, I'm pretty vocal in my speeches. <laughs> um, I, I say, you know what, I, 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 I'm there to defend the rights of all Quebecers and I always push to, you know, protect those who are most vulnerable in society. I, I think that's kind of the role of parliamentarians. Um, but yeah, continue to, like I said, uh, push for just a more inclusive message here in Quebec. Um, but, you know, on the campaign trail too, I'm, I think the thing about a campaign trail and since we had the pandemic and there was two years where it was hard to see people, there were no community events, we weren't getting together. I'm looking forward to hearing from people, um, getting out into, you know, it's been nice in the last couple of uh, weeks. There's been a lot of community events to get to, go and talk to people about what their concerns are. But there's no doubt we're going to have a lot of discussions about the healthcare system, about climate change, about, you know, the cost of living right now and inflation uh, and, you know, protecting our local green spaces, access to transport. So, you know, our Liberal platform has a lot of lot to offer West Islanders, uh, all Quebecers. And, you know, what I want to just pass the message is that Liberals will be out there trying to, you know, form a government and win seats in all the ridings of Quebec. Um, and that's what the Liberal Party's always been about. So I'm, I'm eager, I'm keen, I'm ready for the upcoming election, but I know it's gonna be a lot of work and I'm gonna have to go out there and uh, earn uh, every single vote I get and take absolutely nothing for granted. Right, and thank you so much. It's so good to end on a note of inclusivity and community, especially for the West Island News. That's what we're all about. Yep. Um, and I believe congratulations are in order. You'll be welcoming <laughs> a new family member. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, we're gonna, our, we have a baby due on October 30th, which is actually my birthday. Wow. Uh, so my wife, Marois, who is also the MA for Saint Laurent, is, is very much pregnant. We've passed the 20 week mark. So we had our ultrasound babies, very healthy and looking great. Um, I don't know how she'll be doing her campaigning with the, <laughs> the yeah. big baby bump, but she'll be out there uh, campaigning as much as she possibly can. But we're just, you know, absolutely thrilled and really excited to start another chapter in our lives in October. I'm a little nervous, of course, but uh, it's uh, it's really a blessing and it's just great news, and we're so excited. 
Great. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. No I really problem. appreciate it. It's, it was honestly, it's a pleasure. I always enjoy doing my interviews uh, with West Island News. So uh, everyone out there, I hope you have a good, uh, good rest of your week. And uh, you can always find me on uh, Facebook or Instagram. If you guys have any questions about this interview or uh, any comments, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me. Perfect. Thank you so, so much. This is uh, Hannah Johnson for the West Island News. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.